All right. So I'm going to ask uh, Jennifer to join us now via video and sound. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> Hi. Thanks for joining us today. Um, now, before we begin today's session, please know that all of us at NYU hope you and your family are safe and well in these unprecedented times. It is a time of uncertainty and we're so thankful that you've chosen to spend some of your time with us today to continue learning from the collective knowledge of our NYU community. The NYU Alumni Association represents nearly 600,000 alumni all over the world. On average, we host nearly 700 events annually to connect you with your alumni community and with NYU. In light of the current global crisis, we have moved our programming online and are pleased you are joining us for today's session. If you have questions during the session, please enter them into the question box, the Q&A box on your screen, and we will get to as many questions as we can. Today, we're welcoming Professor Jaquette, who is an Associate Professor of Environmental Studies with the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Affiliated Faculty with Stern and School of Business, and Affiliated Faculty the Center for Data Science. She is the author of Is Shame Necessary? New Uses for an Old Tool, and she recently was featured in uh, BBC's article titled Coronavirus, How to Go for a Walk Safely Without Getting Shamed. Um, and she also has an article of her own that she's written recently that we'll make sure you get more intel on at the end of our presentation. Professor Jaquette, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Um, would you like to see a few words ahead of our interview or would you like to jump in? I, I think you did a great job introducing me. I'll just add um, that you'd say like, why is a Department of Environmental Studies professor working on shame? But um, this is a tool that is actually really handy for solving really large scale cooperative dilemmas like we find ourselves in currently. And so um, I've been using the slogan shame backed by popular demand because during coronavirus, which has a lot of the features, for instance, of climate change, um, although the time frame is sped up uh, and the consequences occur so much more quickly and, and they're so much more visible to many of us, um, these two problems do share some features. So for instance, I've been also studying how, how shaming is used um, to, to solve problems or address problems like climate change. And so of course, when coronavirus came around, this was a, an interesting opportunity for an academic interested in shaming on how this tool would unfold um, in, in service of the community and also, of course, sometimes in, in, in bad ways. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there are so many timely discussions like that's happening right now. So we're really happy to have you here today. I'm going to jump into our five questions. So first question for you is, how can and has shame and guilt been utilized for the public good? So, um, you know, Coronavirus is, is this kind of swift moving, devastating problem that transmits really easily uh, between people and, and that we still don't fully understand. So that makes it already a bit challenging. But when groups like the CDC come out and say, no gatherings of 10 or more, no, um, no uh, interaction that's closer than six feet together, this gave the public a really good, people were sensing like, you know, I, I mentioned this in the article I wrote, I was giving people in Manhattan a lot of dirty looks in early March for coughing, you know, without covering their mouths or sneezing. But when the CDC came out with these very clear rules and they made the social rules sort of conspicuous, then you see shaming sort of ramp up. And shaming, obviously, I think we all sense has been used very uh, actively for social distancing or what we should really be calling physical distancing from one another. And there's a lot of, you know, dirty looks about if you get too close or sometimes people are even saying things. Of course, now with the mask regulation in New York, another very visible rule, visible if you're defying the rule. Um, and these are all standards of behavior that we can monitor and police through shaming. And it doesn't have to be that I'm posting a video of you on Twitter, although that has happened, of course, for, for spring breakers, for instance. Um, but it can just be these, these subtleties, right, that have already served us well, especially in New York life. Dirty looks if you don't clean up after your dog, right? 
a, a kind of moving away of your shoulder if somebody is sneezing without covering their mouth on the subway. So these things are all, you know, we're, we're ramping up and coronavirus shaming 1.0, I call it, is all about those physical distancing, all about transmission of the virus. What's interesting to me is what will come next and what we're already seeing unfold in kind of more strategic ways, strategic uses of shame um, that are not around the physical distancing, which is which I think is in some ways easier, um, but is around things like um, PPE, around which hospitals get ventilators, and around how employers are treating employees, and and also even long-term prospects. You know, I just saw today that Shake Shack gave its money back to the government, for instance. And this this is the kind of like, oh, this gets interesting when we're applying social pressure, not just to individuals over physical distancing, but to major corporations for how they're behaving during this pandemic. Absolutely. I think, I think you've really hit the nail on the head in terms of the many layered ways that we see shaming happening, you know, on a one-to-one -one personal level and then at a sort of a very big macro level when it comes to corporations. Um, and so I, didn't, next I didn't address, I'll just jump in about guilt yeah. because guilt is really interesting. Guilt is ideally how you want, what the tool you want to use to run society because it's the cheapest form of regulation. It means that your individual conscience is regulating your own behavior. I feel too guilty to go outside. I feel too guilty to cough. I feel too guilty because I don't have my mask with me to get out of my car and go in the grocery store. So that is the ideal situation. Unfortunately, a lot of people haven't internalized all of those rules about physical distancing. They haven't internalized the problem, even how, how severe it can be for people who are you know, um, at risk or, or for the elderly. And, and, and most of us, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of unknown risk out there too. So, um, so guilt would be ideal, but given that we don't seem to have, you know, we haven't all internalized those norms, then we require that external pressure of shame. Absolutely, absolutely. And with this in mind, I guess, how do you see it playing into our interactions with each other, you know, going forward? Um, I think we all I think I think everyone's sort of in a different place now with how they're perceiving the threat level. And I think that, you know, we've all seen this over the past few months the news is different day by day, you get new guidances day by day. So how do you see our interactions changing over the next few months? Well, so um, obviously the, there are some people who still haven't really come to terms with the physical distancing. So shame continues to play a pretty aggressive role there in some places. Um, and there are lots of us, especially as the weather gets nicer and if you live in a really dense city like New York, where even enforcing those rules are, it's really going to be tough because there are so many people and so there's so little public space. Um, so we're going to require, uh, you know, there's gonna be, that's why Cuomo keeps coming in and saying it's, it's hard, I know, but we have to do it. You know, we have to we keep, keep having to reestablish those rules. We keep extending the, the stay at home order. You know, all of this is quite hard to deal with psychologically as like, because I think people want, because of this, also this, I think, bad metaphor about a peak, they want this kind of steep decline back to normal, which we all sort of anticipate really isn't coming. It's, it's not going to be a steep decline back to normal. There's going to be fits and starts. There's going to be a lot of unknowns. We're going to open things up. We're probably going to have to close some of the things back down. And that's going to be hard to grapple with, because like I said, shame works well. Any any punishment works well, the clearer rules are. And if the rules are murky, it gets harder to police, obviously. But so the phys so, but let's set the physical distancing stuff aside because, I mean, we could talk about that all day and I worry about how much that, that encompasses because it, it affects so much of us individually. But, but talk about what happened when, for instance, the mayor of New Haven approached Yale University and said, we'd like to use your dorms to, um, to house medical workers that are addressing this crisis. And Yale said, nope. And then the mayor, who was an alum of Yale University, so this is also very important, right? He's an insider to that university, 
uh, called out the fact that Yale said no when the University of New Haven said yes within the first five minutes. And his, the, to me, he was, and he used the media to his advantage that way, and Yale reversed its decision. Uh, Harvard was also called out for letting its cafeteria workers go, and it then reversed its decision for, for doing that. So even within the university setting, we see shaming really active and, and working to try to get universities to do the, the right thing, the moral thing in a time of crisis. Now, the question is, can universities are typically more moral than the average institution, in part because they answer to students and they have reputations and they're really trying to recruit, you know, enlightened undergraduates to attend their, their, their institutions. But can we get other kinds of institutions that don't necessarily look the same way, like banks or arms of the government to also do the right thing in this moment? And so I'm, you know, I'm watching every day. There's interesting things happening. A bank was just shamed for um, uh, using stimulus money to pay off, you know, overdrawn accounts, and uh, they were shamed into giving that money back to individuals during this time of need. Um, we're seeing, we're going to see, I think, a lot of really heated discussions between landlords and tenants, not just individual tenants, but as as you know, like in New York. The, so many small businesses there. And so what I think we need to do moving forward is, is take a bit of a pause, look at how shame is serving us well, look at where it isn't serving us well, think strategically as groups, what kind of actions would are really meaningful? Where, who, where, who are the people most hurt right now? How can we direct some of our attention and opprobrium to helping those people in a time of need? And I'd like to see that kind of strategy. I think shame's been used fairly well during this crisis, and I'd like to see it continue to, to be used well. Uh, you know, seeing the protesters arguing that the state should open up, I think this is a really, this is a, a bad use of, of our efforts, you know, in trying to protect public health and get people on the same page. So we're, you know, we may wind up seeing, especially in this strange political climate of the United States, a bunch of, a bunch of fracturing, which we've seen with politics in so many other ways, um, where we can't really get people to coalesce around, around the same value set. Um, but I, I'm looking forward to, to watching what's coming next. I've seen, again, some groups be really strategic about how they use public opprobrium, and, and I see no reason why it can't be put to good use here. Absolutely. I think that's a, and sort of that leads into really neatly into my next question, which is around, I think many of us in terms of corporate entities and large institutions, we've gotten the, the email from your local coffee shop saying, these are our new measures. These are how we're protecting our workers. Would you donate to the worker relief fund? Um, would you do this and that? And then we also see on the larger level how corporations on the other hand are dealing with it. It's sometimes in ways that are perceived as less helpful, you know, your shake shacks, your, your banks, uh, your, the issues are behind the, um, the private, uh, the small business loan rollout. I think that there's a lot of different pieces that people are seeing and that I think probably many of us are still wrapping our heads around what this means and how we can be intentional and in what we do not only as consumers, but as human beings for each other. So, I mean, I guess, what do you see as next steps? You know, you sort of alluded to, um, you know, the shame being used in good ways and bad ways, air quotes. <laughs> but uh, what do you see as some logical next steps that we can take as consumers, as human beings towards um, holding, holding each other and uh, corporations accountable? Yeah, so I mean, this was part of when when you talked about the subtitle of my book, New Uses for an Old Tool, right, was, was about this idea of trying to get people to not think of shame purely as an experience, which we have all experienced and we know how negative and painful it is, but to think of it as a tool that cannot just be used against individuals, although it is often, but can be used against institutions, against brands, against major corporations, and to ask what are, are the moral problems of using shame there different than the moral problems with using it against individuals. And in fact, they are, because we know that there is no individual experience for Amazon. Now, there are individual employees who may experience 
you know, bad feelings over Amazon being shamed, but Amazon itself does not feel shame, although it will react sometimes to public opprobrium and sometimes in very good ways. Now, I think you're wise to say, or, or certainly it echoes how I feel anyway, that we don't, we haven't really gotten our heads around what's going on. One thing that strikes me is that businesses, especially large corporations that already had a very clear uh, digital platform and were prepared to do deliveries, were in a much better position for this pandemic than local businesses that were analog or that were dealing face to face with the, the places that most of us as the, who live in New York really deeply care about. And so we're seeing this new kind of inequality emerge. You know, who knew that grocery, certain grocery stores would be massive winners during this pandemic and our local restaurants would close. And we have to figure out a way to, to redistribute some of that wealth, of course, and to help to help the small businesses in a time of need, especially because they employ the kinds of people that we care about, the people that we see every day. Um, and I think how it's going to, it's very hard for us to do that again, without those visible rules and visible consequences. So we all have a sort of sense, oh, something's not right here, or the media chose to report on, you know, Shake Shack, but, but we all sense there's a much bigger systemic issue but without really good reporting, investigative journalism, a really good data from the city or, or, or the state, we're going to have a hard time even understanding where the breaches of norms were. So we really do need a collective response. We need, we need people digging into the data to show who the winners and losers are here. If we're talking about how can we use social pressure like shaming or maybe even eventually legislation to reallocate that wealth. Yeah, but absolutely. it doesn't get, I mean, it doesn't get to your, I think there are openings there, but it, we can't just shame sort of in a frivolous way, I think, in, in shaming 2.0. We need to be very considered about it. We need to go after the places where we have, people are, have limited attention right now. Everybody's multitasking. Everybody on this, you know, Zoom call is also reading the New York Times or so, looking something up right now. And because of that too, that we're all sort of looking here and there, we really need it to be a wise use of, of our attention, of our program, because we won't get too many, too many big ass um, in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting. My next question for you was, is shame necessary? I think that it, we found over the past weeks, months that it is. But I guess the, the next question to that is how to channel that into positive action. Um, what are the, you know, I think we talked about reporting and, and you know, being keyed in to facts and figures as, as well as opinions to be able to come to our own conclusions about what's best for us and for those we love. And so I, I would love to hear, you know, beyond, beyond the reporting, how do we then turn that back into what we do in our day-to-day -day lives? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's such an interaction, right, between this kind of, um, the reporting helps direct, I mean, all, all of us are often reading the New York Times or The Guardian or, or Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, whatever. They're, they're directing our attention towards stories. So their role really can't be, you can be on Twitter and, and that can work for your really specific slice of life. But if you're curious about a global pandemic, you know, you have to tap into these larger news sources. Um, and so their role in directing shame is, cannot be downplayed. I mean, we have, to, we have to really care about journalism during this time. We have to care about the facts. We have to care about the reporting, about the data. Um, I hate to sound like a professor, but um, that's just going, that's going to serve us better in the long run than just tapping into our gut. Because we don't want to get, we're all so hemmed in right now. You know, we have like a a one mile radius to our lives and we can't let that consume our worldview entirely. So we want to be thinking, you know, I think we want to think about that area, but we also want to think further out at the city level, at the state level, at the federal level, at the international level. And what's also clear is, um, you know, it's not, people don't want to talk about shame right now because we're already feeling bad enough 
about everything else in our lives. We're looking for positivity. I mean, watching AOC go deliver food is refreshing to me. Like I'm, I, it's, it's nice to see that she's not always, you know, calling somebody out. I, I love, of course, when she does that in Congress or anywhere, but it, that she's also setting a, a positive example. And remember that um, the, the mayor of, of New Haven would not have been as successful in my view of getting Yale to change its mind had the University of New Haven not said yes within five minutes, right? So we have to still have all of that positive behavior, all of those good examples to turn to, to say, can you not be like this? And I think there's a real crisis of leadership, not just in, um, and that's, I mean, Shake Shack should be applauded for that in a way, because the rational economic model says you would never give that, that money back um, to the government. You just got $10 million. And, they're doing that. I mean, it's a long-term business strategy, but they're setting an example that now we can turn to, to say, look, if you don't need the money, there are companies that are giving this money back. If you don't need that stimulus money, give it to the workers that you know that do need it. And so this is the way that honor and shame are two parts of the same puzzle and can be leveraged against one another in really interesting ways. So I think, you know, we, we have to, look to who's being called out and look for the places that's, you know, that are directing our attention. And we also have to look for positive examples to tether that to that shape, that shame too, so that we understand what level of altruistic behavior is even possible. Um, the final thing I'll say is that shaming always has done much better, the more creative it is because it relies on our attention. And so what we also need right now is, a, is to embrace the arts, to embrace really clever ways. You know, I'm sure you just saw, um, or many of you have seen the, um, the nurses who stood in the way of the protests against stay at home in Denver. And there's a reason why they're wearing their scrubs, right? There's a reason why they're dressed as they are because they're trying to represent a certain faction of society. And the more we can do, I mean, that's not, super artistic, but it has a visual element to it that's really powerful. And the more we can also strategize that way to think, you know, if lines are being drawn and if we are in this tumultuous period, how can we capture people's attention and say, look, here's the people who are saying, um, you know, I'm the one side of this debate and here are the others. So I think there's a lot of um, thinking that has to go on, you know, of course, the beating the pots and pans at, at 7 p.m. Like that's it's such a powerful uh, artistic wonderful expression of humanity. We need that level of expression, even for the negative uh, emotions too, so that, and so that people know there's a way back from there, you know, and, uh, and we can all come together and act collectively um, for something that really we can't do alone. This is a collective problem. Yes, absolutely. And I guess that kind of goes into my last question, which is, what we as individuals can do. Um, I think that beating pots and pans at seven every night is great. It's, in, on a personal note, it's funny because it's when I feed my dog every night and I, it's sort of like an alarm clock and I go out and I'll, you know, you'll, you'll have a big hurrah for healthcare workers and then give something to my little creature that I'm taking care of. And um, so thinking about how we can take care of those in our household, how we can take care of each other, how we can positively influence those around us, be that family members who might not have come along just yet to, to what the most positive actions they can take in their day-to-day -day lives are. Um, I, I would love to just I guess some last tips on, you know, if we have folks in our lives who um, on an individual level are not coming along, what are, what are positive ways we can influence them? Um, be that to, to donate to healthcare, to donate to City Harvest, to, to join us in beating pots and pans. Uh, what, would your, what would your thoughts be on that? Well, you know, I have, um, like so many people, pe members of my own family who are taking this less seriously, of course, than the average person is. And 
It's a challenge, you know, I, so for instance, you know, I wrote this book on shame and then so people, you know, they barely want to talk to me as I, as it is, but then they probably, you know, they're like, so do you shame your child? And I, I don't think shaming should be used in our interpersonal interactions very much. I don't want to shame my children. I don't want to shame my parents. That's not, it's not the place that I live and die for, you know, to call people out. Um, I'm interested so first and foremost, as an individual, though, I'm interested in defending shame as a tool. So I don't think everyone, when they think shame, should think, oh, that moment in eighth grade when X, you know, like we, you need to think about that experience. And that's why shaming is powerful, right? Because of its, its painful nature, but that it's a tool that has been used in so many different amazing ways, sometimes for really important collective problems. So that's my main challenge to the individual is to not just think of shame as the personal experience that you went through, to think of it as one, you know, we have vaccines, we have treatments, we have regulation, we have shaming. Like it's a tool in our kit. How can we use this tool well, you know? Um, and we want to think about, you know, just like how we want to think about which medicine should we use right now? Some medicines can be good in a certain moment, some are terrible. Um, there's a dose response mechanism, all that's true for shame. With my own family members, then I think, you know, coming at this as caring about people is the number one way to do it. You know, no one wants to hear you're breaking the rules and you're ruining it for everybody else and you're putting everybody at risk and you're going to ruin people's lives. That's a last resort, you know, set of arguments that you want to make toward your loved ones. You want to be like, I care about you. I'm worried for you for these reasons. I'm worried for the help, the workers in your community. I'm worried this is going to put additional stress on the medical system that it can't take right now. Um, and please, if if for no other reason, do this for me. And then when all of that doesn't work, you have shame is a last resort tool, especially interpersonally. And yeah. And also, you know, you don't have to be direct about it. Ridicule, sarcasm, joking around. This is all part of shaming too, you know, gossiping with my sister about what my mother, you know, that's all lightweight shaming that can be used in a time like this to pretty strong effect, especially for the physical distancing stuff. Now, it can't be used as well for PPE in hospitals. Like we have to think more strategically when it comes to that level of directing resources toward cooperation dilemmas. But for the physical distancing stuff, we can, we can use all sorts of lightweight measures that, um, that will be forgiven for, and that will not have a long lasting, terrible effect on your family life. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think that's, that's so key. And, you know, at this time, remembering to take care of each other and to, to, to point, use shame to point to not, not where, you know, someone could be, you know, falling short, but how they can give more in a way is so important. Um, you know, there are a lot of people out there struggling right now, um, be that in the entertainment industry, be that in the restaurant industry, um, people who were in homelessness before now and are, you know, that much more burdened by this. Um, and so those who can, um, who can help think, you know, positively influencing to do so, them to do so is going to be, I think, key to how we get through this together. Um, so I am going to switch over to some of our questions that Great. have come through. Um, let's see. So we had a question early on. Um, are there risks to shaming others? <laughs> It seems that shame can result in feelings of anger, resentment, and possibly opposition. How does one work with that? Yeah, that, I mean, that's the biggest risk of shame. That's what we're all afraid of. And that's what we've all in some ways experienced in one way or another, and why we view this as kind of a nuclear tool. Um, and that's totally understandable. But as I say, um, there are ways. So, so one example in the book that I use, because there have been a lot of, um, people who have made the argument that the state should not be involved with shaming punishments at all. So if you recall, like books like The Scarlet Letter or even The Dunce Camp at schools, these were viewed as really kind of archaic, uh, unnecessary, cruel punishments. 
okay, yes, I agree with all of that. Get them out of our lives. I don't want to have somebody carrying a sign that says I was caught drunk driving either. But if the state of California has, most people pay their taxes, right? Especially individuals, they pay their income tax. But some people don't. And some of those people are very, very wealthy, as it turns out. And it's very difficult at the state level, the federal level, the federal government can put you in prison if you don't pay your taxes. The state government has very few tools, formal tools available to it. So the state of California, for instance, and many other states now have done this, um, said, you know what, we're going to post a website on the top 500 delinquent taxpayers. So this is a shaming punishment because it does not shame, it, a transparency policy would say we're going to expose everybody. They said, we're just gonna expose the top 500 tax delinquents. And before we expose them, we're gonna send them a letter that says, if you don't pay up in six months, we're gonna put your name on this website. So actually it turns out the threat of shame can be more effective than shaming itself for a bunch of probably obvious reasons. And so it turns out that that policy has gotten the state hundreds of millions of dollars in back taxes back. It costs them about $130,000 a year to run. It has not led to, they were worried about violence against the agency. They were worried about self-harm. It hasn't led to those things. It's led to rich people figuring out how to sell off one of their properties and pay their state taxes the way that everybody else does. And I view that as a very effective, fair, um, not risky use of shame, even by the state. And so are there forms that, of shame that are horrible? Yes, there are. We have to evaluate them on a case-by-case -case basis, but shaming itself is not horrible. It, it, there are times when it's appropriate, cheap, effective, and benefits all of us. Yes, absolutely. And another question is, um, how do we best police for our basic liberties in the current climate? Um, fines and are getting public cooperation without penalties, perhaps, yeah. you know, sort of the other side of the coin. Right. I mean, you look at, so shaming, for instance, is doing a great job. It seems great. Um, it's, it's being effective in social distancing in certain parts of New York, for instance. But you may have seen that the cams that check, that um, automatically detect speeders, you know, they're they're finding accidents are increasing, traffic uh, or, or car-related deaths, because people are going so fast. They didn't used to be able to travel so quickly on these roads, and now you have basically cars behaving in ways that are defying speed limits. And so here's a perfect example of, um, you know, where the, the, the formal punishment is stepping into, you know, you, shaming's not working there because there's not enough there's not even great ways of shaming speeders, as we know. The formal punishment stepping in, it's not, it's also not working. And so there are clear um, trade-offs, you know, I'm not arguing like, oh, society is much better off right now. Um, there are things that we're grappling with, there are things that we're not. In terms of the, the personal liberties, oh, this is so tough, right? Because we know that um, the states that have been, the, the countries that have been more effective have made those trade-offs against personal liberties. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really hard in a country like the United States with very low trust in the government um, to effectively implement those things. I mean, we're, we're really um, in a difficult position because cultural, we, we, we're not used to it. We're not even used to doing it. You know, the leaders are not comfortable in that position, most of them. And then the citizenry is really, really not um, comfortable. And so I don't see shaming as being likely used in at least personal surveillance issues because I don't see there being enough of shared values around those cases. But I do see it um, coalescing around, for instance, worker treatment. I mean, um, most Americans share some of the values around how workers should be given sick leave at a time like this, for instance. Um, and so I think it can be used, you know, it will be used for some to, to reinforce some values and not, and not others. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then another question we have, we'll maybe take this one and then one more okay. um, before we wrap up is um, uh, one of our attendees found that shaming people without masks and gloves in public places um, 
can be decreased when others, i.e., you know, be that the police or other public, um, sure. other public uh, m sort of municipal entities hand out supplies to folks or businesses perhaps can help in handing out supplies um, rather than shaming people for not having the supplies that they might not have access to. Um, would more of this um, be a positive way to use shame to to get people the things that they need? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is a really um, strong point, right? Like th at that point you go, you have no excuse to not be wearing mask or gloves because they were given to you. So again, this makes the, the standard very visible um, and the, the norm of behavior um, easier to enforce. Whereas like you say, I mean, this happens in New York City sometimes with picking up after your dog though, where you'll see, you'll see somebody grappling with the, the fact that they didn't bring a doggy bag at that moment. And they're sort of like scrambling. They're like, do you have anything? And they can't bring their dog into a shop to get something. And they're, they're in a kind of panic over this. And you can tell they don't want to be shamed for something because they haven't, just because they don't have the supplies they need. I will say that, um, this, these problems that we're all dealing with are very short-term problems. I mean, even in the span, even if this lasts till 2022, it's still relatively short-term. We're having to adjust very quickly. We're having to get masks and gloves that we didn't own before. Um, I think that it's reasonable to assume that shaming somebody without masks and gloves would be less effective and less desirable in the first week of that rule than it would in the third or fourth week of that rule. Um, and so the availability, become, you know, that plays into early term uh, behaviors, but less into later term behaviors, right? Um, and so, so certainly if you can make that, those things available in the short run um, so that, you know, that rule gets established quickly and people don't feel the need. We don't want to use shame frivolously. We don't want to waste our attention and a program on things that people really do want to do and they're and they're trying to do that they're trying to go buy a mask right now um so i'd say that you know there's a way to make shaming more palatable if the supplies are available and you've gotten them three three weeks from now than there is three days from now so that you'd see like this weird ramping up of of shame's acceptability and effectiveness um, over that time period. And then maybe it'll wear off again, because exactly to this point about shame working for the short run, um, does it create feelings of resentment? It's not even the feelings of resentment, which it, it, that could be definitely part of the liability, but it's also just that it's a really needy tool. It requires constantly putting your attention into this kind of problem. And people get tired of talking about the same problems. A great example, I mean, the film Blackfish that, that shamed SeaWorld for orcas in captivity, something I tracked because I, it, was such a, it was such an interesting case of really having a clear target. Um, just this past year, SeaWorld attendance, this film was made in 2013, attendance had been dropping, 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 stock value went down. But last year it went up again, the, the attendance at SeaWorld. And it shows you there is a kind of half-life of shaming and if nothing, if formal punishment never steps in, if new rules are never agreed upon, it, it can't solve the problem forever. It can't keep putting pressure on. Um, it, it probably can for, for certain hygiene related things. You know, Fauci's talking about, will we ever shake hands again? Um, it, may, it may be that we never need a formal rule to say you cannot shake hands. It just becomes part of how we do things. But when you have, you know, major companies are, it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard to see shame completely solving our social problems, frankly. It's just, it's just one tool in a much bigger, robust, interesting toolbox. Absolutely. And perhaps, perhaps there aren't some top of mind considering the, the trajectory of our conversation, but there was a question that sort of, um, nods to this and that shame can definitely work um, short term. Um, I think they're struggling with how it can work long term um, in terms of, I think, going back to the feelings of resentment, potential grievance. Um, what are the alternatives that out there for shaming? 
Well, so of course, you know, I, we talk about, I think about punishment as sort of formal punishments, punishments that belong only to the right of the state. They're in the hands of the state, essentially. And then informal punishments, with, which is shaming and things that, that um, citizens can take on. And again, states can sometimes implement shaming policies. It's rare, but they do. Um, so when you think about what's the long-term strategy, I mean, the legal system is a long-term strategy and it has its own problems, of course. It's much slower. Um, it's more expensive. It, um, when it makes mistakes, it often makes mistakes in the ways that reflect the biases of the culture at large, you know, not that shaming doesn't, shaming also does that, does that too, but you have then it, you know, formalized into a state system. Um, and so there are alternatives, you know, I think as you've seen physical distancing rules become more uh, formally enforced, Sometimes police are handing out tickets now. You actually saw shame put on the gas, the, the brakes a little bit um, and shame backed off of that. And then what I'm arguing is then we can use that tool for something else where formal punishment is absent. So we've always seen um, in, in a lot of dilemmas a kind of interaction between a formal system of punishment and an informal system of punishment. And they're, they're always doing a dance essentially with one another. So there are lots of other options. Um, and the hope though, is that people realize, you know, that, that, we, that we reflect upon the bad side of society, the punishments we have to enact. And we try to think, how could we do this in the, as the most fair way possible to get the biggest collective gain here? Um, and, and that was what motivated me to write the book and think about shame for, you know, five years was, the idea that maybe this tool could, you know, when it is used well and, and does, you know, in a way serve us all, what are the features that, that make that happen? And how can we harness those against these large scale problems like climate change, like the wildlife trade and like coronavirus? That's great. Thank you so much. This has been a really illuminating conversation, I think for me and certainly for our listeners. Um, I'm going to put up a quick screen share so can make sure everyone can see um, your book. So um, thank you for joining us today, Professor Jaquette. Um, if you'd like to learn more on this topic and um, her research, you can reference her book, Is Shame Necessary? New Uses for an Old Tool. Um, she also had a recent article in Medium, um, Public Shaming Has Only Just Begun. Um, and I think that many of us can agree that we're going to see more of this in our own lives, in the public sphere. Um, so I hope that you guys will take a check in, second to check out her book um, and her article. And um, again, Thank you, Professor Jaquette, for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for joining me. Absolutely. Um, and to you attendees, if you're interested in further scholarly content, uh, please check out our NYU alumni page um, under events and programs. Uh, we have many programs coming up. Uh, you can tune in tomorrow to hear more from our professional studies colleagues on the impact of COVID-19 on the hospitality industry and uh, for some project management tips from our NYU Entrepreneurial, Entrepreneurial Institute. Uh, so thank you again for joining us and we here at NYU wish all of you good health and safety. Thank you.